Hey, it's good to have you here. Come on in, have a seat. Welcome to the Beyond Picket Fences podcast. We are your hosts, Mandy Benneke and Naomi Marquez. Hey, before we get started, I'd like to let you know that we had some technical recording issues that caused the recording to be muffled in places. We are still learning the technical piece of the podcast, but this is more about telling our stories than about winning an Oscar for sound production, at least for now. One more thing, before we get to my story, we'd love if you could support us by becoming a Patreon member. Go to patreon.com slash join slash beyond picket fences to sign up for bonus episodes, early release episodes, and more. While we love bringing these podcasts to you each week, the software, equipment, and hosting sites cost money that adds up month over month. For just the price of a cup of coffee or less, you can help support us by signing up for our Patreon page, and in turn, we'll show our appreciation by giving you more. As always, thank you for your support. Now pull up a chair. Hey, Naomi. Hey, Mandy. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I am okay. Um, This week we started this weird at-home school, weird Mm -hmm. new norm. I hate that phrase. Everyone else does too, but it is a weird Mm -hmm. new norm. It's good. It's good. It's just such a different... um, uh, different way of life, different schedule, different daily schedule, different weekly schedule. Um, and my kids are getting used to school at home, which is just totally different, but it's great. It's great. I love the school that they're going to, they're going to connections Academy. It's all online, super organized, which is amazing because the school that they had last spring that was online was anything but organized. Um, so, I mean, it's been a nice change in that way, but it's just getting used to a new normal, but I'm good otherwise. So week one, check. Uh, almost two days left. Oh, shoot. what day is two, it? It's only three days in. Oh, crap. <laughs> crap. We got two days left. Okay. We can do it. All right. So today, today we are going to talk about, uh, part of my story. It's very, very interesting. I can't wait for everybody. I was just telling Naomi, it's, it's not something everybody knows about, um, but, and it's kind of gross. <laughs> so a little warning there. <laughs> it's pretty graphic and gross, but I'm going to tell it all. So um, here we go. So my story. So about, let's see, it's 2020. Um, in 2015, I believe it was January, just the beginning of the year. I uh, was working as an accountant in uh, a, pr- a pretty pretty good c- c- uh, position uh, for the head of a small company. Um, and I all of a sudden basically started pooping blood. <laughs> so uh, I did, you know what I always do and, and shoved any health conditions or pain or anything down. And I kept working and I kept being a mom and I kept, kept, kept on doing what I do. And then about two weeks after pooping, (laughs) pooping blood every single day, I started having abdominal pain to the point where one morning I got up and was getting ready for work and I was doubled over and I couldn't, I couldn't stand up. It was just so painful. So I told Jonathan, my husband, that um, I was having some bad cramps and it was no big deal. I didn't tell him I was pooping blood and that I was going to just drive to the ER quick to get checked out. So I hopped in my car, drove myself to one of these mobile ERs by us um, and they got me right in. It was uh, those those little mobile ERs are great, by the way, for getting in quickly I'm um, getting seen right away. Um, the doctor saw me, asked what was going on, just just a couple little checks, and left the room, came back in the room, and said, I've called the local hospital, Aurora Medical Center. They have a bed for you, and we're going to put you in an ambulance and take you there right now. 
And so then I started freaking out a little bit. I was, um, I was freaking out a little bit before because the first thing I thought of, you know, when you're, <laughs> when you're passing blood is there's obviously something wrong inside. And the first thing I thought was cancer. Like something is, is wrong. There must be a tumor somewhere. Something's bleeding. Um, and so I already had like that, that fear that, you know, it was really bad. Uh, but when they said that they were going to transport me to the hospital immediately and that they were going to admit me, I knew something was pretty bad. So I called Jonathan and told him, you know, this is a lot worse than I thought. They're taking me to the hospital. Um, so he met me there. And when I get there, I realized they had, um, they had reserved or found a room in the oncology ward, which obviously is the cancer ward. So that, you know, obviously I was a, a lot more scared um, because then that, that kind of confirmed that, you know, they were thinking cancer as well or something was really wrong, really wrong. So I was admitted and um, lots of doctors uh, came in, lots of questions, trying to figure out what's going on. And they, they would, they didn't know where, where I was bleeding internally. So they had to do a lot of different tests. And so the first test they did while I was in the hospital was, uh, oh, what did they call it? An up or basically what they check, um, they go down your throat with a tube and they check your esophagus mm -hmm. and they check your stomach for ulcers mm -hmm. and things like that. I forget the name of that. But so they put me under for that test and found nothing. And then they did a, an ultrasound on my abdomen to check for any lumps, check my gallbladder since I was having abdominal pain to see if there was something going on there. Didn't really see anything abnormal there. Um, so they decided to do a colonoscopy while I was in the hospital. <laughs> so... I had to uh, prep while in the hospital for a colonoscopy. And I don't know, have you had a, a colonoscopy yet? No. Not yet. No, not yet. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's really fun. The prep, <laughs> the prep is so much worse than the colonoscopy itself. But so basically, I won't go into much detail, but for a colonoscopy prep, for anyone who hasn't had it, you have to, um, they give you these pills to clear out your intestinal tract so they can take a camera and look through it. Um, and you drink tons and tons of liquid to like flush it out. So like for, I don't know, I think it was like 10 hours straight. You're basically like drinking this liquid and you're, it's like mass, like super massive diarrhea for that whole time just to clean out your entire intestinal tract. So I did that overnight. And then in the morning I went in and they put you under again for the colonoscopy and they, uh, after I got out of the colonoscopy, they're like, Oh, great. We found the problem. I said, Oh, wonderful. What, what, what did you find? And they said, well, we went in there and we found what we think is called ischemic colitis. And I said, okay, great. What's that? They said, well, it's, it's basically a part of your lower intestine that is inflamed. And, um, t typically women get it who are on birth control and our smokers, um, if you have a, like a cocaine or that type of drug habit, um, heavy, heavy alcohol abuse, things like that. And I said, well, okay, uh, I'm not on birth control. I don't smoke. I don't use cocaine. <laughs> None of that. And they were kind of taken aback because they just assumed that, oh, we found it. This is what it is. She must, you know do all these or some of these habits that have caused this. And, and I didn't. So they're like, okay, well back to the drawing board. So, um, they, they had me go to a gastroenterologist, um, for follow-up to see if they could figure out what's going on. So I went to the gastro, um, this whole time. So I went from pooping blood. I, I wasn't on any medications or, or any treatment because they didn't know what I had. So I went from pooping blood to um, then at the, at the point where I got into the gastro, 
I was having diarrhea daily and it got so bad to the point where I was having it 25 to 30 times a day. So I couldn't, I couldn't go anywhere. I could barely, like I'd eat and then I would, it would go right through me. And so obviously the condition had gotten worse and I, I couldn't live like that. And um, so I went to the gastro and they asked me all these questions. Um, there's additional testing they could do. So they set me up for a, a specific blood test where they check for um, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. And I think there was one more, but I can't remember what it is. Um, and then uh, I also was set up for an upper GI pass through, which is where you swallow barium and you stand in front of an, in front of an x-ray machine and they watch the barium as it passes through your body. It's actually kind of cool. Um, as it passes through your esophagus and into your stomach lining um, and then to your small intestine. And what they're looking for um, is what happens when it passes through your small intestine because that is a test where they can determine Crohn's disease, which is what they thought at this point I may have because of all the symptoms that I was having. Um, so I got the test results from that back and that was clear. Nothing wrong. And about, <clears throat> about that time, I had developed what's called a fistula. Have you heard of that? Mm -mm. So fistula, <laughs> super, um, super gross, but probably the most pain thing, of, painful thing I've ever dealt with, even more than childbirth. So fistulas are um, basically little canals that develop um, in your body, and they're not exactly sure why, but they'll go from an organ to either another organ. So they're like little canals that develop from one organ to another or from an organ to the outside of your body or your skin. So I had developed one from my lower intestine, my lower colon, to the outside of basically my butt. <laughs> and so I was uh, at home and in pain. I mean, this this pain was like so much that I was crying and I couldn't I couldn't sleep. And Jonathan thought I was dying. And um, so one night in the middle of the night, he took me to the ER, and the ER doctor was like, "Oh, you have you have a hemorrhoid." And I was like, "This is I've been pregnant before. I've had hemorrhoids before. This is not a hemorrhoid." And so um, he, the doctor. Uh, gave me Dilaudid intravenously, uh, which I'm told is a stronger painkiller. That's what than... they used for my aunt with stage four breast cancer before she died because she was so much in pain that they just sedated her until she died. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm told, yeah, that Dilaudid is like more, I don't know, stronger than most painkillers except for morphine. I think the next highest one is morphine. But anyway, so they give me allotted intravenously, which worked wonderfully for 15 minutes. And after 15 minutes, it started wearing off and the pain was back full bore again. And so I said, I need more. And they said, we can't give you more. It'll kill you. I said, well, I need something else. And they said, you have allotted in your system. You can't have anything. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, well, when can I have something? And they said, you've got to wait at least four hours which this, I mean, the pain was so excruciating. The thought of that, I mean, I was kind of delusional at that point because the pain was so bad. The pain was so bad. And we've talked about this, Naomi, before. This is the point where I was becoming so delusional because of the pain that I thought if I can just go to sleep and die, then the pain would be gone and that would be much better, which is crazy to think of now because, um, because of course I don't think that way and that doesn't, I'm, I'm not suicidal at all and I never have been, but um, it has made me more empathetic to people who are in pain, either physically or mentally, because I understand where that takes you and um, how you don't necessarily mean to be there or hurt anyone or hurt yourself. So um, that's, that's kind of a side as you know, that's probably the worst, worst, my, you know, the rock bottom of this whole illness was that part. So, so this is when I'm in the ER. So Jonathan brings me back home. 
um, with a diagnosis of a hemorrhoid and uh, in pain. And um, so then I'm kind of stuck with, I don't, I don't know what to do. So Jonathan waited till morning. He went to the local pot shop <laughs> Jonathan. and he bought everything they had. He bought um, patches, pain killing or whatever marijuana patches they have for, for pain. Um, he bought what, uh, like a, I don't even, I don't, I don't smoke weed. So like a pipe with actually different kinds of marijuana to actually smoke, um, pills, like all sorts of, of stuff. And I, ironically, it's, it's weird, but, um, it helped better than the, the allotted, which is crazy to me still, but it, it got me through, um, to the next day or two when I could finally get into, um, I went to a proctologist to see what was going on with the fistula. Cause I knew it wasn't, it was more than just, um, just a, a hemorrhoid. And so I get into the proctologist and she knows exactly what it is. Um, and <laughs> the key, so the cure for a fistula, baby, baby, Basically, what happens is this canal develops because have you heard of leaky gut? Oh yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, in your it, it usually happens in your colon, and it happens more often with people with Crohn's Crohn's disease than it happens with people with ulcerative colitis. About one in thirty-five people get it who have ulcerative colitis. Um, but a little tiny hole develops in your colon, and so a little basically canal develops to support that leakage. Um, and so even though this canal develops, there's, there's really nowhere for it to go and it becomes inflamed and infected. And so it basically you have like this, this little canal inside of infection inside your body and it, it's got nowhere to go. Um, and so um, the cure or the treatment, I guess, for, a fistula is to cut a hole in it, physically just cut a hole in it, stick a tube all the way through to, you know, I don't know, it was like two or three inches. So I don't know, that's a, as far as this tube was into my body, leave the tube in for several days until it stops draining. <laughs> so I have this now, I'm in pain, I have this tube. <laughs> Um, that is coming out of basically like near my butt crack and draining. And, um, so then I go through that and I have, I have these wonderful friends in the meantime, I have neighbors bringing the, the family food and I have one good friend who came over and watched the kids while I, you know, went to the ER and that same friend said, you know, how are you going to get that tube out? I said, well, I'm, they, they told me I'm supposed to pull it out when it stops draining. <laughs> she goes, oh my God, if you need someone to pull it out, I'll do it for you. <laughs> so I have these amazing friends. I mean, who, who volunteers to do that? That's amazing. Well, she did. <laughs> she did. <laughs> she didn't. Thank you, she. <laughs> Thank you, she. Um, so, so, okay, I you know, dealt with the fistula. It all healed up well, thank goodness. Um, and then I had another appointment with the, um, the GI doctor. Um, at that point, the blood test had come back and I did not have celiacs. I did not have Crohn's, but I may have ulcerative colitis. And then I told him the news that you know, what all of that I'd had dealt with, with the fistula. And he said, ah, he goes, oh, well, that kind of solidifies your diagnosis. Fistulas are common with Crohn's disease, not so common with ulcerative colitis, but because of the area in my colon that was inflamed when they went in, um, they put everything together and um, gave me the diagnosis of ulcerative colitis, which was wonderful because that means they could try medications at that point. So I was relieved and um, they started 
uh, they tried to start a special medication to stop inflammation immediately, the inflammation that was going inside on inside my body. But that um, medication wasn't covered by the insurance I had at the time. And it was going to cost like $1,500 a month. And so uh, whatever, that's a whole, a whole other story, but part of my story. So um, I had to fight with the insurance company for a while with that. Um, and then they put me on another medication, Lealda, that is pretty common uh, for people with ulcerative colitis that I was supposed to be on for the rest of my life. That was covered by insurance. Um, I eventually got on um, basically prednisone, high doses of prednisone, because prednisone is cheap. Um, it's a steroid. And what, what it does is it um, stops your body I guess I should back up. So ulcerative colitis is a, um, it is an autoimmune disease. And what happens with, with it is your body starts attacking itself and it doesn't know when to shut it off. So whatever, uh, in my case, it was stress and I believe to be my diet at the time, which I can go into later, but um, the combination of those two um, my body was just attacking my colon over and over and over, and it just didn't know when to shut that off. So what prednisone does or what a steroid does is it tells, it shuts your immune system off and says, stop working altogether. So prednisone works wonderfully, but anyone who's been on it knows it has horrible side effects, horrible. So um, I had, I was on prednisone, I believe for I want to say like four months till the inflammation stopped. But for me, it was, it was totally worth it. I got all of the side effects. I didn't sleep for months. I was, I got what was called moon face, which is a huge round face and get a ton of weight gain. And I was super crabby. I didn't care about anything. And, um, but those are the typical side effects of prednisone, um, and regardless that, you know, it worked, it, it helped me heal. So, so I was glad I was on the path of healing. Um, and right around that same time, I, I can't remember if it was right before that. May I ask if we're still in 2015? You were in, still in 2015. So sorry. Um, I went into the hospital in January of 2015. And I finally got my diagnosis, I want to say end of March, early April. So um, at that point, then I could start healing. So um, I can't remember if it was right before or right after I had been put on um, anxiety medication by my doctor because I was having anxiety attacks. Um, so I was on two different anxiety med medications. So that's relevant because with with any uh, autoimmune disease, you have to take care of the the stress, or it's just going to continue to come back. These this the incidents where I had where I was bleeding, all the diarrhea, all of that. Um, that's what people with um, autoimmune disease call a flare. So if you hear them talk about a flare, that's what that means. They're real sick, and you know they're having all their symptoms at once, and then hopefully eventually they'll get better. But um, you have to take care of what's causing that, just like any other illness, really, um, or you're going to continue to flare. And the more you flare, um, especially with with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, the more wear and tear you put on your your organs. So eventually you can lose part or all of your colon. Um, so you really have to get that under control. I knew... I had an anxiety issue. I knew I was under a lot of stress. So I had to fix it. So at that point, I decided to make a major life change or job change, I guess, and um, quit um, quit the accounting position I was in and go into real estate full time because then I could manage my hours. And, um, so that is, is what I did. And that, that actually helped a lot. Um, I started paying attention to, um, more attention to myself. I think we talked 
in another podcast with, can't remember which, I think it was the vulnerability podcast with Laura Goldstein. We talked about how I got into yoga and I was so, gosh, people suggested yoga to me all the time. And I was like, oh, this is so boring and so weak. And so I was big into CrossFit and weightlifting at the time that I got real sick. I was also um, on a paleo keto diet. So eating high fat, high protein. I, I, I looked really good. I looked muscular. I looked like I was really fit. Um, but I also, at that time, was the most high stress, high anxiety, out of control time mentally in my life. So um, so I, I got my real estate license. Um, and eventually, I left my full-time job, which was awesome and really scary at the same time because I was leaving uh, a position where I had a full-time dependable income and my husband was also a real estate agent. So we were going from at least, you know, one person having an income to potentially neither of us having an income. So that was stressful. Uh, the other key part of that, uh, that part of my story is, um, when, he, when I switched from a full-time position to basically working for myself in real estate, um, I lost health insurance. So I had to figure out that piece. Um, so what I did is I started, I do what I always do. I researched like crazy and I was like, somebody has to have fixed the, this problem or their autoimmune disease by some other way. Um, because I had researched to find out how much my medications were going to cost. And prednisone is cheap. That's easy to get. But that's that's only when I'm on a flare. The Lialda that I had to take for the rest of my life would cost us about $350 a month. And that's on the health plan that we would purchase, like the independent health plan or whatever. And um, so I knew that I'd, I'd have to find an alternative or get off of that medication somehow. So I started researching and researching and I came across a story. I think her name is Dr. Brooke Goldner. She was uh, diagnosed at a young age, like I, I want to say like 15, don't quote me, um, with lupus. And she was told that she would not live very, you know, very long into her, like the, she wouldn't make it to like 30. It was, she had a really bad um, she would never have children. Uh, she would just never lead a normal life. She started a plant-based diet and eventually got off all of her medications. She, All of her tests for lupus went away. The doctors were puzzled because she so, showed no markers for lupus at all. And this is like months after starting a plant-based diet. So I was like, okay, well, lupus is pretty bad. And that's also an autoimmune disease. If it works for that, maybe it'll work for me. So I, I was still on the Alda. I had basically, um, got as much, as many of the pills as I could before I left. So I got like three months worth or whatever. And, um, so I was still on the, the medication and I started a plant-based diet and I started it pretty strictly. I was like, okay, this is, you know, if I got to go full, full in if I'm going to do this. So I did that. At the time, I was still on um, the two medications for anxiety as well. I was on Lexapro and I was on um, lorazepam, which is a pretty heavy hitter for um, basically major anxiety attacks. So within two to three months, this, this, all, this all took a little bit of time. So this was 2017 when I had quit the quit, um, my accounting position. So you were still there from, you were diagnosed in April of 2015. Mm -hmm. You started healing in that four months. You started feeling better after that, but you stayed at your job the rest of 2015, all of 2016 into 2017. Correct. With still all that stress. Correct. Trying to figure out what you're going to do to take care of yourself. Correct. That's a lot. Yeah. Well, I had to get, I, I had my uh, real estate license uh, before, 
but I had, it had expired. So I had to take the classes and, and get it again. Um, and honestly, at the time that I was diagnosed, my job that I had was, they were so good to me. They allowed me to do the bare minimum from my bed. I, I was bedridden at the time that I was, um, from between the time I was in the hospital until I was diagnosed for, so for two months, I was pretty much bedridden. Um, and they allowed me to work from home, um, and kind of do the bare minimum and they still paid me my full wage. So they were, they were really good to me. Um, but it was a high stress position and they knew that. So, um, may I ask how you stayed healthy between when you went back full time? Till 2017 when you quit like what helped you get through that for the people listening that have the same challenge right how do you yeah so with so obviously I had I, I kept my job I had to keep my job um and so I started recognizing the areas in my life that um were were stressful that I could change I couldn't change my job at the time but what I did recognize is, um, as a mother, and I've talked about this before, um, there's all this pressure to be involved in everything, in everything that you're asked to do. So I was, um, I was involved in the PTCO. I was volunteering for my kids' classes. You know, I was um, volunteering for events anytime there was any sort of neighborhood party or somebody was selling something at an MLM party, I felt like I had to go just to be supportive. And so I recognized that all of those things were just adding up and causing all this extra stress on me. So I basically just learned to say no, which is one of the you know best lessons I think anyone can learn. Um, so, I, you know, I was still working, but in my personal time, I started learning how to control that time and make it mine. And I started taking long walks in the morning. I'd wake up early and and walk for, you know, three, four miles and just either listen to a podcast or a book or just by myself to my thoughts, you know, um, just to take that time to myself. And so that's, and I was on medication, Mm -hmm. medication helped. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, so two to three months after I started the plant-based diet, I started weaning myself off of the medication to see how I would do. And I haven't taken it since and I've had no flares. So, uh, for me, it has helped along with stress reduction. And by stress reduction, I mean changing my entire life so that I can focus more on my health and myself and my family and things that I want to focus on. And, um, and then within, I don't know, maybe a month after that, I took myself off of my anxiety medications. I weaned myself off. If you're listening, do not just take yourself off anxiety medications. Call your doctor first because you can't just take yourself off of them. <laughs> Most of them you have to wean yourself off. Anyways, I weaned myself off of the anxiety medications and I have had zero anxiety attacks as well. So I have been on a plant-based uh, diet, whole foods plant-based diet is the full term for uh, since 2017. So three years and I'm not perfect. And in fact, during COVID, I've kind of gotten a little bit lax Um but for the most part, I stick to it and, um, it works for me. You haven't had any flare ups since no flares kind of during COVID. There hasn't no flares. So there's no, like you have to be so strict. No. So you, you've seen that you can relax a little bit if you need to. Right. And you don't have to uh, judge yourself because you missed it thinking you're going to Right. Ruin everything you've done, all the work that you've done right. to get where you are. Well, and that's another part of it. Like all the stress that you put on yourself to be perfect in mm-hmm. different ways, you know, because when I started that, you know, you, you, you research a lot, like, you know, what does this food, what does it do for me? What does this food 
you know, how does it cause, um, or like if you're eating something that's not whole food, so you have to look at all the ingredients, like, is there, I don't know, like uh, gelatin in it because gelatin is an animal based product. And so that's not good for you. And so after all this researching and, and constantly, constantly monitoring what you're taking in, you start to think, well, if I do eat something, then that's bad. And then, you know, I was like, well, I'm, I'm vegan. And so I started, I joined, you know, I didn't join the vegan community. There's no card for that, but you know, you're, you know, you start thinking, okay, well, great. I'm, you know, I'm saving the planet. I'm, you know, helping, I'm not killing animals, which is wonderful. And, and then, you know, you eat fish or something and you feel horrible. Um, and so judging yourself for, you know, making one little screw up that causes a lot of stress too, but I've learned to let that go because nobody else cares. <laughs> yeah. I, it's a fascinating story. So just so everybody knows, I did not know all those details before this. Yeah, most people don't. They're pretty gross. It, <laughs> so it's it, not something you bring up in a dinner no. party. <laughs> Let me tell you about my shit Let me tell you about my poop <laughs> and my fistula. <laughs> I will tell you, I it's inspirational. You know, I think about the the notes that I took are um, when you were at, you said you were bedridden for a piece that that was at your breaking point. So before that, when you were trying to figure out why you were bleeding when you were pooping and you were having the cramps, were you working full time? Yes. And, and doing CrossFit. Well, that was my next, we did CrossFit at the same studio. Uh-huh. I'm looking and back probably and probably running. <laughs> yeah. And we would, doing we would it do all. an hour CrossFit session. Uh huh with weightlifting, running, uh-huh. and interval training, uh-huh. while you were having all this, yes, you couldn't tell. And the pain, like how... Well, and I looked, so if you, if you look at me now, I look younger than I did now because of the plant-based diet. But uh, physically, I looked probably, I guess, the best I had in my life. I was super muscular, like I looked super fit. But, like, health-wise, I was a wreck. Your insides were a wreck. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's just, it blows my mind how you were doing CrossFit through all this. I I know how hard CrossFit is. Uh-huh. You can't do that unless you're in prime condition. Right. And that tells you how magnificent your mind and your body was to push you through all that pain for CrossFit. It is that is not for the week, <laughs> right. okay? CrossFit well, is a fact, very, very difficult. In fact, that's fitness so. Program. My, um, I had a physical therapist because I had gotten some injuries from CrossFit, and my, my doctors. I, I, I had seen three different gastroenterologists, and they told me your body when you have an autoimmune disease, your body doesn't know the difference between. Um, like CrossFit stress, like physical active stress or emotional stress. It just recognizes stress. And so it, that immune res- autoimmune response will turn on, even if that stress is, you know, what you think is a good stress on your body, like, like, you know, hard exercise. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why I had to stop with the vigorous running and CrossFit and all of that, because my body was like, it's still stress. That's shocking. So when you're, when you have an autoimmune disease and you don't know you have it, Mm -hmm. right. And you have this daily or weekly or monthly routine that automatically has stress from how you deal, however, your family structure is, your work structure, your fitness structure. Mm -hmm. And if your body and your mind can't tell the difference between the stressors. Nothing you do can cause stress. And you don't know that. So whether it's a workout stress that you think you're doing really great, getting mm-hmm. yourself healthy, right? Stressing over making a meal for your family because everybody's ready to eat and they're all hungry and you're trying to get it ready and try to make sure everything's good to the stressors at work. 
trying to make sure all your chores are done at home. Right. It doesn't, it can't tell. Right. It doesn't know what you're doing. It's just, it just sees it as stress. So. So when you think you're doing well with an autoimmune disease and you think you're doing the right thing by working out and staying healthy, it it could be harmful. You could be potentially exacerbating the Mm -hmm. problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, exercise is also um, key in maintaining your health with an autoimmune disease. So it's just finding the right type of exercise, like the yoga. right level. Why, why yoga? Yoga the... or hiking or people, mm-hmm. some people can mm-hmm. run. Mm-hmm. Um, I, can, I mean, I can run if it's just not obsessing and going overboard. You know, it's, it's when you go overboard and your body's like, hey, hey hold on. Can't you know, it. yeah. So the last one I have is about health insurance. Mm-hmm. So how difficult was it to deal with your health insurance with the autoimmune disease? Because, you know, I have several girlfriends who have autoimmune diseases and they have had to go holistic through this because the health insurance company mm-hmm. did not give them a path for success. Right. And they've had to really spend a lot of money on outside of their medical right. insurance to be right. able to help themselves. What was your experience with the health insurance? Yes. So health insurance is basically... I like to call it um, disease insurance, or, or uh, it doesn't it doesn't help with with solving the underlying issues of any any you know disease or problem that you have. Um, it's really good for you know for acute injuries like breaking your leg or things like that. But um, so for me, with the doctor, with this always this baffled me. So with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, I went through three gastroenterologists. So this is a person that their specialty is the digestive system, the lower digestive system. I went through three before I found one that would admit that anything I eat affects the lower digestive system. Like that just seems like remedial to me. Like that is what it does, right? Like it, it processes your food. It would seem to me that that would have something to do with, with your system. I went to Kaiser. Kaiser was the last one I had. Um, and that was the first, first gastro who said, you know, what you eat does have an impact on your, your bowels and your intestine. Um, but I mean, despite that, so the gastro is covered under insurance, but a nutritionist is not. So here she says, you know, eat a lot of berries, things like that. But doctors aren't nutritionists. Doctors, they on average have to, they have four hours of nutrition training in their 12 years of of schooling. And unless they go for additional schooling on nutrition, they are not nutritionists. In my opinion, they should not be giving out nutritional advice. The problem is insurance companies don't recognize that um, holistic doctors and nutritionists who are trying to get at the root of the problem and solve the problem um, at the root, um, they don't cover them. So I never had access to a nutritionist. Luckily, I study like crazy and I went and got my own holistic nutrition degree, basically for myself, um, and to ha- honestly to help other people. I've since started, you know, coaching on the side a couple of different people um, close to me, and um, with the same diet, I uh, helped a family member um, lower his blood pressure um, to the point where it's he's healthy. I mean, he was at the point where he's going to have a heart attack before, and then um, an, a friend of ours uh, was pre, uh, pre-diabetic and she's no longer pre-diabetic. So that's amazing. Um, yeah. So, but I mean, insurance, you don't have access to, to that. And I mean, unless you have a lot of money to, to pay for sessions with a dietitian or a nutritionist or something like that, um, therapy isn't covered any, any sort of therapy. Um, none of that's covered. So even if you are insured, all you're, all you're given is a band-aid. What resources would you tell people to go to if they wanted to have 
the, the additional support that they need on nutrition? I would say to research, read, look up whole foods, plant-based diet. Um, one of the best um, documentaries out there is um, a Forks Over Knives. It's been around for a long time. Um, it's probably still on Netflix, and I can I can check it out and put it in the show notes. But there's lots of documentaries on whole food plant based diet out there. Um, there's a new one called Game Changers, and it's more geared toward toward um, athletes. But there's uh, the book that I recommend is called uh, How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger, and he goes through every chapter is a different, um, different health issue. So he goes through cancer, breast cancer specifically, blood cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, lung disease, um, and autoimmune disease and heart disease. And the great thing about the whole food plant-based diet is that it is the cure for almost all of these and um it is the only diet known to reverse um heart disease it it reverses type 2 diabetes um and so i would just say research um there's lots of uh lots of reading material and documentaries out there and just just start there are you coaching people on the I, side, anybody wanted to reach out are you doing that on the side or is that not I'm not currently right coaching now? and I would um I would consider it I just haven't I don't have the time right now <laughs> there you go there you go maybe in the future <laughs> but I have coached friends and I'm I'm happy to like I've had lots of friends reach out especially like as women like there's so many as we get into our thirties and forties who are diagnosed as pre-diabetic and it's so scary or hypertension and going on medications is, is scary. It's expensive. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions or, you know, if you want to shoot us an email just to, to guide you into the right direction, it's, it's easy once you figure out what you should and shouldn't do. Mm-hmm. Um, but nobody ever teaches you these things. And in fact, what we're taught is what's killing us in the first place, Mm -hmm. right? Especially Mm -hmm. now we've got this huge, and this may sound a little preachy, but I I wholeheartedly believe this. We've got this huge craze in the protein industry, pushing and pushing and pushing us to eat um, not only, you know, loads of protein in the form of, you know, animals like eggs and chicken and whatever, but they're also pushing it in chemicals, like in these protein powders and and things like that, which to your body, no good. And, you know, having cancer before that, in fact, it does harm to your body. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. cancer feeds off of these Mm -hmm. things. So um, not only are we, do we not know what we should about nutrition, we're fed, we're fed harmful advice on how to eat. So Would you, I use uh, Thrive Market to help me when I'm trying to buy food Mm because it helps me sort by paleo or vegan or gluten-free. Is that something that you can use on a plant-based diet as well? Yeah. Yeah. So I tend to, yeah, Thrive Market um, is great. Um, Sprouts Market, Whole Foods. Uh, So basically on a plant-based diet, you want to avoid as many animal products as you can. So dairy, eggs, um, any meats, including fish, including especially chicken or poultry, um, lunch meats, things like that. And then um, avoid as many processed foods as possible. So it's a pretty simple diet. And I say the word diet because I, I every animal on the earth has a diet. I know people hate that word, but um, with the whole foods plant-based diet, you actually eat a lot more per day than you do. It's a high fiber diet. So you stay full. You're not feeling deprived at all. And it's all foods that are really good for you. Um, so you're eating a lot of fruits, a lot of it. Like I'm talking a lot, like like 10 to 12 servings a day as opposed to whatever the 
recommended yeah. four or five is. Um, and so it's, it's good foods. You're full. Um, and it's very simple mm-hmm. once you get down to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, um, we can have another podcast. I think it would be really interesting to go into um, what a day looks like, right? What do mm-hmm. you eat? What does that look like? I know that when I was diagnosed with cancer, the first thing they did was gave me a meal plan. Mm-hmm. And they said, you are going to start this today. Lucky you. And I not had, everybody gets that. I had the best doctors. So when I tell my story, you guys had a really great experience. They gave me a meal plan and I had a couple years before I'd taken a nutrition class with my Pilates instructor. And mm-hmm. she had already started us on servings of vegetables and times that by four and we have those for breakfast. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she changed the way that we ate, which kept us full gave us a lot more fiber, yeah. took away all the processed food. And it's something that as you look at the first thing that you have to do when you're sick yeah. is eat healthy and change what you're putting in your body. So it'd be fascinating to go through. It's amazing what that how looks like. quickly changing that diet, how quickly mm-hmm. that takes a, an effect on the body. Um, that family member that lowered the blood pressure within 14 days, it went from like 190 was the, the upper number is that the systolic number down to like 130, which is still a little bit high, but I mean, that's not, you know, it's not at the dangerous level where you're going to have heart attack, but it, it took days, literally days My for that to happen. My is a diabetic and she came to stay with me when I was sick and took care of me and she had to eat the way I ate Mm -hmm. and best number she's had within a week. It's crazy how quickly it works. And it's, it's, it's challenging because it's keeping that up. Right. Right. So I think that would be a great podcast to talk about how can you keep it up? Changing How do you change it? Mm -hmm. What's the best way to do it? Because both of us have had to do that Mm -hmm. and it is a commitment, but you don't beat yourself up when you don't do it. Right. And it's finding the way in the hectic chaos of your day to still be able to to eat right. Well, I have yeah. to tell you, you are really amazing with this, what you've done and how you were able to control the outcome of your illness and what medication you're on. Thank you. You're a superhero. It was, uh, I tell people I would go through it again. Like if... If I had the choice of, of not having gone through that, not having a diagnosis and and going through it all, I would definitely go through it all because I think we've talked a million times before, the awakening is so much better than after, than, than life before. So The awakening is so much better. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Great job. Great job. High five. High five. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. See you next time. See you soon. Bye.